and welcome to A Word for This Day podcast. I'm Jory Schaefer, the show's host and creator, and it is my joy and pleasure to welcome you today. Welcome to anyone who's found us for the first time. It's no accident that you're here, friend. I'm so glad you found us. And I would encourage you to stick around for a little while. Don't run off quite yet. Let's see what the Lord has for us in his word today. And then welcome back to you regular listeners. Thank you for downloading day after day after day. I'm just so thankful for you. I wish I knew who all of you were. Um, I tell you that frequently and I really mean it. I wish I could see you. I wish I could talk to you. I wish I could pray for your specific prayer request. But the Lord knows. And so I'm just thankful that we have this podcast medium. I'm thankful that we can share in this way together. And so I would encourage you in saying that to please consider sharing this podcast with friends, neighbors, family, relatives, just uh, anybody you work with, anyone who you think may also wish to come along this journey with us. Know that I pray for you frequently. I continue to pray that the Lord will draw you closer to Him give you more of a desire to know him and his word and that you will carve that time out. Friends, we make time for the things that are important to us. I'm learning that more and more. Um, And so we do have enough hours. We do have enough minutes, but sometimes we have to um, put aside the things that are uh, wasted time. And we have to say, okay, I'm going to invest my time into things that that matter long term and friends you will not um, do anything more important than spending time with the father and then being obedient to what he says after you've spent time with him and so he has so graciously given us his word he's so graciously given those of us who are believers his holy spirit to guide us and convict us and to teach us and so i just love that we get to be here together um i do love to hear from you so if you feel so led send me a message sometime you can find my email down in the show notes it's a word for this day at gmail.com the other things that you find in the show notes are a list of the many of the scriptures that i reference during each episode and so i do that for you so you could go back and uh, look a lot of these things up and um I would encourage you to do that in your personal Bible study time. Please make sure that this is not the only time that you think about God's Word today, friend. Have a memory verse you're working on. Um, have uh, your own other Bible study that you're doing or a group Bible study. Uh, be reading the Scriptures. Be uh, spending time in worship and in praise and in prayer. And we can do those things throughout the day. And so I just want to encourage you that it is very important and very beneficial. And no time spent doing any of those activities is ever wasted. Well, our verse for the day for December the 24th, 2023, comes from the Gospel of John. John chapter 12, verse 24, and it reads as follows from the English Standard Version. Truly, I say, oh, no, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Oh, my. There's a lot of stuff here that Jesus was talking about, and I'm excited for us to park here and see what we can learn. Um, He definitely was talking about the truth about planting things, Uh, but oh, it was so much deeper than that, and so I'm excited for us to see what we can learn. Uh, But you know, if you've been on this journey with me any length of time at all, that this is the time in this podcast that I think it's wise for us to find out where we are in the scripture and get the background, get the appropriate context, find out who the author of this book or letter is, where it's located, what was going on, and all that. That will help us uh, remember it and to apply it, be able to share it, and so I'm excited that we take the time to do that. So we are in the Gospels, and we're in the Gospel of John. We know that there are four Gospels. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they begin the New Testament. That word gospel means good news, and so the um, 
four Gospels tell us the good news of Jesus' earthly ministry. And why was it good news? Oh, it was good news because God sent His one and only Son. God so loved the world that He sent His Son uh, that whosoever would believe in Him should not perish but ever but have everlasting life. It was good news that Jesus left splendor and the glory that was in heaven. It was good news that he came here to this earth in the form of a helpless baby and that he grew to be a um, strong man who walked on this earth. He was uh, fully God, yet fully man, um, and he was completely without sin. And so he lived his earthly life without sin and he uh, then was crucified. He was, uh, after he died, placed in a tomb, and he was there for three days, and then he was resurrected in full bodily form. He was seen by many, and he ascended back to heaven, and he's seated at the right hand of God. In doing all of that, he willingly laid down his life. He knew what he was doing when he came to this earth. He knew what he had left, he knew that he was being obedient to the Father, and um, he he laid down his life for you and for me, and it's because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we read in the scripture that God's wrath is going to come against unrighteousness. It's going to come against sin, and so uh, without someone paying that penalty or or paying what we owed, we were going to owe the penalty for our sin against a holy God. And the wages of sin is death. That's what we get. That's what we earn for sinning against a holy God. But God loved us so much that he asked his one and only son to come and be that sacrifice in our place. And that's exactly what Jesus did. And it didn't just stop when he died. The way that he was victorious, the way that he has been victorious is that he defeated death and hell and sin in the grave. He was resurrected in full bodily form. And um, in that way, we know we can have eternal life because he conquered that. Um, death no longer has victory over him. Death no longer has victory over the believer in Christ. And so what a blessing. And the Gospels tell us about that. And God used four different men from four different backgrounds with four different writing styles to write these four Gospels. They're all just a little different, but taken together, we can get a better picture of what it was like while Jesus was here on this earth. Matthew and John's Gospels were written by the by two apostles who walked with the Lord Jesus daily on a regular basis. They saw him... Um, when he was tired, they saw him when he was hungry. They saw him perform these miracles. They saw him be crucified. They saw him after his resurrection. They saw him ascend back to heaven. So these men were eyewitnesses. Luke and Mark's gospels were written by men who were not in that original apostle group. And so they were not eyewitnesses, but they were very close to those who were. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that God used those two groups of men to write these gospels for us um, because we're in one of those two groups you know at one point we were in the group who didn't know Jesus until somebody who knew him told us about him and then now that we know about him we can tell someone who doesn't know about Jesus so that they can know him and then they can tell someone else and that's how that gospel is, sh is shared um Matthew's audience t seems to be, and we talked about this a few days ago, primarily the Jewish audience. He was trying to get his uh, fellow Jews to understand that Jesus was this long-awaited Messiah. Mark's uh, gospel what seemed to have more of a Gentile audience, and it thought it was thought that it was written to some Romans because of the way that he deals with different things, um, the way he reckons time, some of the references he made to different things uh, that Jews should have known. So it's like he was explaining it to Romans so that they would understand it. It's thought that he was a very close traveling companion with the Apostle Peter and that he wrote much of what Peter uh, had told during his 
uh, time spreading the good news. Luke's gospel was written by the only Gentile writer that we have in the New Testament. He was a physician. We've talked about his gospel uh, recently. He wrote both the gospel of Luke and the gospel of Acts. John's gospel was different. John was the longest living of the apostles. He wrote the gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. He and his brother uh, James were fishermen, and they were apostles. They were called by the Lord Jesus while they were still in their fishing boat with their dad. They were sons of Zebedee, and they left their uh, their boats and their nets, and they followed him. And... Uh, we know that John describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and I don't think he did that in any way to be arrogant. I think he did that because he knew the depths of the grace and the love and the mercy and the forgiveness that had been shown him. We read that John was very close to the Lord Jesus. He and James and Peter were kind of in that inner circle uh, they saw the Lord Jesus be uh, transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then John also was um, at the foot of the cross with Mary, Jesus's mother. And while Jesus was hanging on the cross, he looked to uh, Mary and said, Woman, here's your son, and to John and said, Here's your mother. And the scripture says that uh, from that day on, John took Mary into his home and took care of her. So the Lord Jesus trusted him greatly with the care of his earthly mother. We know, uh, I think I mentioned this, that he's the longest surviving of the apostles. It's thought that he wrote his gospel and these letters in the book of Revelation much later than the original three gospels were written. John's gospel has a very different flavor. It uh, has a lot of imagery. It has a lot more, it seems, of Jesus's prayers and his words um, in red and uh, we don't see the parables in John's Gospels, um, but, oh, I'm so thankful for what we uh, see when we put all of these together. And I love that John tells us why he writes the, what he writes. I just love it when authors do that. Um, it's very helpful. But John says in chapter 20 of his gospel, verse 30, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why I wrote, so people would believe, so that they could have eternal life. And I love what he puts in First John uh, chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, when he says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. It was so important. And God just graciously gave him by the power of the Holy Spirit the words to be able to say and to be able to explain so that people could know, so that they could believe. And we just see such that theme throughout the writings of John. Um, when he wrote the book of Revelation, he was out on the Isle of Patmos. He was um, had, was exiled out there because of the testimony, because he was telling about Jesus. And God graciously allowed him to see into the throne room of heaven and to see things that would be happening um, in days to come and to see glimpses of that new heaven and that new earth and the new Jerusalem. And um, I'm just so thankful that God told him to write those things down. It gives us um, things to think about and much excitement. But so many of John's writings just give us ways to know if we are saved and how we are saved. And I'm just so thankful that we have those. So we start here in John's gospel. I'm going to give you the little overview. We've read this part a lot of times, but John goes all the way back to the beginning. And he says, um, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. We've talked about that already just a few days ago. <clears throat> and so John gives just these wonderful, this wonderful imagery, and you'll see him talk about light versus darkness a lot in his writings, and I'm so thankful for that. 
but he opens it up that way and then he goes and uh, tells about John the Baptist and he tells about Jesus's earthly ministry beginning and tells about the calling of the first disciples and one of the very first miracles and then um it's very interesting that the, John is able to tell show from this overview from the beginning of his gospel the deity of God of God the son of Jesus and sh- talks about him going in and cleansing the temple and knowing men's heart hearts and then we read about the Pharisee Nicodemus coming to the Lord Jesus at night and that's where we uh hear this a verse that we quote so often for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then we see that um, John continues to show all of these different things about what Jesus has done, um, the signs that prove that he is God's son. And uh, we see that very much leading all the way up to where we get into our Uh, section where our verse is uh, for the day. Uh, But in the chapters before that, we see about Jesus performing miracles um, over the natural realm. Uh, We see him uh, healing people, and we see him performing uh, miracles over the spiritual realm, casting out demons and um, all of those things. And I'm just so thankful for that. We also see that he has these run-ins with the Pharisees, and um, then in chapter 12, which is where we'll find our verse for the day, we see about the triumphal entry when Jesus came into Jerusalem on the donkey, and the people uh, put their palm branches and their uh, garments down and said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and um, and then how they very quickly turned away, and Jesus begins to prepare his disciples And that's where we'll find our verse for the day. But let's back up just a little bit and read the story of the triumphal entry. If you think about what has happened before um, in chapter 11, uh, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead after Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. And so that clearly showed uh, his power over death in um, then we uh, continue to see, as we talked about, that there's that under undercurrent of the religious leaders plotting to take Jesus out. And it says here in chapter 12, verse 12, and we're going to read this leading up to our verse for the day. It says, the next day, um, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So just before we get into this next section, um, there were those who had seen Jesus, who knew, who not only had heard about Jesus, but who were there at the tomb that saw uh, Lazarus come out. And so they were bearing witness. And then the crowds, which were very easily swayed, as we could tell, um, were laying those palm dran- branches down and saying, blessed is he who uh, comes in the name of the Lord. But the Pharisees were realizing we really can't do anything right now because the crowd is on his side. That's basically what was um, happening there in, in verse 19. And then in verse 20, it says, now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip and Greeks meant that they were not, um, they were not Jews. So they, These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. 
truly, I, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, as we're reading through that, you may say, well, why did he say that? Why didn't he answer them and say, oh, yeah, tell them to come on and talk to me? You know, but let's think about the big picture here. Um, Up until this point, it seems a lot of times when Jesus had done uh, his signs or miracles, um, sometimes he would tell people, you know, don't tell anyone about this. Or he would say, "Um, my hour has not yet come. And now we see that 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 tide is turning just a little bit. His hour is getting ready to come. And so... um, Those Greeks who came, they wanted to see him in person um, because they had heard about what he did with Lazarus and what else he had done. And so they went through his disciples. They went to Philip, and then Philip uh, told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And um, this changes because now Jesus says the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And when you hear that word, you think, oh, he's, um, it, things are going to be good. He's going to be, everybody's going, I suspect this is what the uh, disciples, the apostles thought. Well, everybody's going to know who he is right away. You know, he's the Messiah. He's going to sweep in and, and show them all. Um, but then he gives so much like Jesus does because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He sees the big picture. We often don't. Uh, right after that, he tells us something that is our verse for the day, and it seems to not fit, but I think you'll get it here. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's beginning to prepare them that the way in which he's going to be glorified is not going to be the way the world thinks it should be. It's not going to be the way his he, the apostles and the disciples think it, it's going to be. Uh, it's not the way the crowds think it is going to be. Uh, it's going to be different. And so he gives them this um, metaphor or, well, it's a truth about how um, how things happen when we plant seeds and then they grow up. You know, they have to be buried under the ground. They have to be covered with dirt and water has to go over them. And then uh, it changes and that life springs forth and springs up out of the dirt. And um, so it did match the way that he would be glorified, but they didn't quite see it yet. And it reminds me of what we read in the verses way up before that, um, where he says uh, in verse 16, it was after he had come riding um, into Jerusalem on the donkey. And it says his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. So um, there would be a time later in that where he's glorified, where he was resurrected and he ascended back to heaven, that it would all come together when that Holy Spirit came down, that they'd be like, oh, oh, we see what you're talking about here. Um, But where he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He he was giving them the example of wheat, but he was talking about himself. He was talking about that he was going to lay down his life. He was going to be buried in the ground, but he was going to be resurrected, and it would bear much fruit. It would bear much fruit in the lives of anyone who would believe. It would give eternal life because he had laid down his life for everyone, for the whole world. And um, I just love that we see that. And then Jesus goes on in the verses right after that to explain um, what it will mean for them as well. Uh, For those who are listening, he says, Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. In other words, um, 
if you hold on to just what you can see, and we talked about this, I believe we talked about this yesterday, um, if you hold on to the earthly things that are temporal, you're going to miss out. But if you can realize that there is more to come in, in following Christ, if we lay down our lives, we deny ourselves and, and lay down our uh, what our desires are and seek to do what he wants us to do, seek to glorify him, um, seek to honor him, we believe in him, we follow him, uh, we lay down what we see here, but we have have eternal life to look forward to and he says whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this world in other words we consider it as um, not the main thing <laughs> um we consider that there's more to come. We'll keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So you have that encouragement. We know that in... um in denying ourselves, in denying uh, what we think is best, but going with what he tells us is best, uh, that is that is where we will have that life. Because in following him and believing him and trusting him and believing that he has saved us and what he has done for us, and in following him as our Lord and Savior, we will have that eternal life. We will have that relationship with the Father. Uh, we will have that relationship with the Son and the Holy Spirit. And I'm just so thankful for that. Uh, but this, uh, this metaphor, this example of a grain of wheat dying and then uh, sprouting up and bearing much fruit is such a wonderful uh, thing for us to think about. That's what happens um, as Paul talked about in the resurrection. He says in 1 Corinthians, I love this, he says in verse uh, chapter 15, verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that's just exactly what Jesus had said here. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable, or in other words, it, it can die. Um, what is raised is imperishable. In other words, it cannot die. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, which is talking about Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And so um, I love that Jesus was uh, preparing his disciples. They didn't realize it to act till after that he would die before he was fully glorified. Uh, but also because he did that, we can be, we know that there's a resurrection for us like we read here because of what he did for us. Because he conquered death and hell and sin in the grave, we have that. And so when our uh, natural body dies like we read here in 1 Corinthians 15 and that is sown in the ground, it's put in the ground or whatever happens to it, perishable. If we are in Christ, we are going to be raised with him. We're going to be resurrected with him, imperishable. 
And I love this. Um, and we'll close with this in First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, continuing in verse 50. It says, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this imperishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Um, Jesus was glorified because he laid down his life and then he defeated death and hell and sin in the grave. He was resurrected in full bodily form. Many saw him and then after some time he ascended back to heaven and <clears throat> He, in doing that, he bore much fruit, just like what he describes when we plant a grain in the in the ground, and it grows up and bears much fruit. And it's that fruit that is born out in our lives. It's that that salvation, that fruit of uh, salvation for all of us, and that would accept it. And I'm so so thankful for that. So may we look to him. May we. Uh, do what he would have us to do. May we seek his His will and his way and his word. That's why it's so important for us to read and study and live and share his word um, and be excited for, for what is coming in eternity for those of us who uh, believe. Blessings to you, friends. Until next time.